everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. At a moment during Heidi Sapinka's luminous debut novel, a journalist makes her way to a small cabin in the tropical rainforest of the Sierra Madre to interview acoustic biologist Ivory Frame. Among other observations, she notes magnificent mass of white hair and a loose Victorian bun. Something startling about her looks. The intensity of her gaze is almost impossible to withstand. She often describes her body as having, buzz, as, as having a buzzing, almost mystic energy. She plainly prefers the company of animals to people. Who is Ivory Frame and what is this dictionary of animal languages she's dedicated most of her life to compiling? Trying to get to the heart of the matter, the journalist also remarks, she seems to keep most of the information in her head. And indeed, it's from deep inside that head that we encounter the, this compelling story, discovering the twists and turns of Ivory's exceptional life from her point of view. It's a life that takes her from England to Bohemian Paris in the 30s and ultimately to North America. And even at the age of 92, there might just be a final twist in the road ahead, when Ivory receives word that she apparently has a granddaughter, despite never having had children. Heidi Sapinka has worked in, as a bush cook in the Yukon, a travel writer in Southeast Asia, a helicopter pilot, a magazine editor and a columnist for the Globe and Mail, and is a designer and the co-founder of clothing line Horses Atelier. Her writing has won a National Magazine Award. The Dictionary of Animal Languages is her first novel. In addition to being a captivating portrait of a life adventurously lived, the Dictionary of Animal Languages is also a meticulous meditation on the nature of art, of the mind, of creativity, of words, of how time passes and how we use it before it runs out on us. Rivka Gletchen called the Dictionary of Animal Languages such a special book, suffused with an almost painterly intelligence, while Claire Cameron enthused with stunning prose, lavish details, deep wisdom and emotional precision, reading this book is like falling in love. My interest in everything else was lost. Please join me in welcoming Heidi Sapinka to Shakespeare and Company. Thank you. So I think to begin, um, as, I, as I said to you upstairs, I generally kind of avoid the sort of where do you get your crazy ideas kind of uh, question that often gets posed to writers. <laughs> but I think in this case, uh, from what I've learned about the, the genesis of the Dictionary of An Animal Languages, um, it's actually there's quite an interesting story behind it. And that story is connected to uh, the surrealist artist Leonora Carrington. Yes, it is. Um, interestingly, I sort of, I, I had an image came to me first when I was writing, when, before I started writing. And actually I was living in Paris. I was, um, I had a small, I had a baby strapped to me. I often peered through the window of this bookshop and couldn't come in because he was sort of writhing on me. But I had this notion that I, I kept getting this image of a woman, a really old woman, um, working on a project of great importance for herself, but also for sort of the larger, um, you know, for the world in a mm -hmm. sense. And, and it wouldn't go away. And I just sort of had to explore it. So I sort of, I wrote and I, I wrote kind of a, a rough draft and I sort of hated it, mm -hmm. like I guess most writers do. <laughs> Um, and then I sort of, I was in the library in in a library in Canada where I live, and um, I pulled out. I was looking for a different book. I was looking for Anne Carson's mm. Autobiography of Red, and mm -hmm. right beside Anne Carson was Leonora Carrington. And it was a book called The Hearing Trumpet. So I pulled it off the shelf and I looked at it and I thought, well, this is interesting. So the the main character in the book. Mm -hmm. um, the heroine was 92, and that was the same age as my heroine. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, not many people write about 92-year-olds. <laughs> and then when I looked at Leonora Carrington, she herself was 92. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, something's something's at work here. The synchronicity is yeah. impressive. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just I had to sort of further explore it. So I found she was living in Mexico City. She was, as you mentioned, she was born in Lancashire, and she spent time with the Surrealists in Paris in the 30s. She'd had a, um, an affair with Max Ernst, who was much older than her. She'd sort of gone mad. And 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 she during the war, and then he was pulled away, and and she she spent time in an mm -hmm. asylum in Spain, and then she sailed over, um, and then wound up in Mexico City, mm -hmm. and that's where she spent the, the next seventy years of her life. So, I found I found that she was living there, so I thought I'll go look for her. Mm -hmm like normal people do. <laughs> <laughs> and I pulled a couple of, of friends along with me um, and we decided we would go on this quest and thought like if you know if we don't find her mm -hmm. maybe it will be okay. We This was just sort of like let's just sort of jump in and see where yeah. we'll land kind of thing. So we, we, we looked up the in the Paginas Blancas mm -hmm. um, and found her number and then we just kept calling uh -huh. um, and finally someone answered and it was a hair salon. Okay. <laughs> so that wasn't going to work out for us. <laughs> so, and we were staying with a friend 
French filmmaker and he sort of said he sort of looked puzzled like you don't have access or you don't have her address mm-hmm. and we sort of like dejectedly drank tequila on his <laughs> rooftop and and then um, and then he calls us up the next day and says oh my god my ex-girlfriend lives on her street huh. and so we thought well we have to you know so within a few hours we were knocking mm. on her door and she had a, a Spanish housekeeper who opened the door and sort of let us in and Leonora herself was standing there mm. with you know three sweaters on and her like blazing electric eyes and we sort of spent two afternoons in her house mm-hmm. which was and then when I came home I just completely rewrote my draft because I realized that you know well a lot of things I mm-hmm. guess after I'd met her <laughs> Was she um, amenable to being interviewed then? It sounded sort of like once you'd found her address, this sort of went incredibly well, smoothly. I mean, it first wasn't that smooth. Uh-huh. She's a little bit sort of standoffish uh-huh. and a bit steely, but, but generous mm-hmm. with herself as well. And she sort of, I mean, I'm imagining she didn't have a lot of groupies at that point. Uh-huh. So that worked in our favor. <laughs> um, and so she sort of, we had a brief chat mm-hmm. and it was a bit stilted and a bit tricky. Um, and then she invited us to come back the mm-hmm. next day. And it was sort of like Groundhog Day because we realized we could sort of um, fix our mistakes. So we came uh-huh. with offerings. She, she smoked Marlboros without uh-huh. filters, so we brought those, and that, was, that went a long way. <laughs> and then we just sat in her house. It had a tree growing through it. She had Lee Millers mm-hmm. and, um, you know, Picassos and Max Ernst pa- um, paintings, and it was quite incredible. Mm-hmm. And she sort of went all over the place in her mind. She sort of talked a lot about her childhood with her Celtic myths uh, mm-hmm. told to her by her grandmother and then she talked about the Surrealists and what a jerk Picasso was. Uh-huh. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and then she sort of talked about you know her time um, painting. She painted posters for the Mexican Women's Liberation mm-hmm. Movement, which she was sort of a, an ori- original founder. And so she sort of went all over the place and it sort of gave me license to do the same in my book. Because mm. I thought when you reach an age like this um, all the, th- the events aren't organized sequentially in your mind. They're sort of organized by their emotional intensity. Mm -hmm. So I sort of realized that to sort of organize events takes away their power. Mm -hmm. They they just come, the way memories come to you, you don't Mm -hmm. really, you know, you don't ask for them. They just sort of come. So so one of the big effects then was a sort of a structural effect on the the draft that you've been writing. A structural, definitely. And then the other thing was tone because Mm -hmm. I'd sort of realized, oh my God, after spending a couple of afternoons with a 92 year old that my sentences were way too long. Uh You know, she didn't, she wasn't going to do these long breathless mm-hmm. sentences they were very short and to the point so that also on a on a sort of tonal level mm-hmm. I, I really I figured something out and I remember the writer Elena Ferrante said that once you get the tone you get the engine of a project uh-huh. and that's sort of how, what I felt with mm-hmm. her she, she gave me tone and she gave me structure mm-hmm. and some pretty amazing events in her life that I, yeah. that I definitely was inspired by and they sort of folded their way into the book too I wonder if the short sentences could have had anything to do with the Marlboros as well it's <laughs> probably I mean she smoked them right up till she died at 96 I think mm-hmm. it was so they weren't affecting her that much <laughs> it's a good yeah. lesson for everybody yes, exactly. smoke, smoke your face <laughs> off <You'll laughs> now before we come in to talk specifically about uh, ivory frame so the, the hero um, the heroine rather of, um, mm-hmm. of the dictionary of animal languages um Paris is uh, one of the principal settings mm-hmm. of this book, um, and it's a um, it's a Paris what we we experience from several epochs, mm-hmm. um, and it's a Paris that some people will find uh, familiar from the city that they've seen or the city that they've that they've read about, mm-hmm. and of course Paris is a city which has been written and written mm-hmm. and written, mm-hmm. um, and I think certainly in the, the dictionary of animal languages we do get. There's a freshness to Paris, um, which I think is actually quite hard to achieve <laughs> in um, in writing. So I'd just like to talk a little bit about how you were able not only to to get Paris onto the page, but also to to uh, think yourself back into Paris of the 1930s. Mm, um, that's a great question. I mean, I, as I said, I sort of became a Flenner when I lived here, mm-hmm. as probably most people do, because it's just you can kind of just get lost in mm. this city. It's such a great walking city. Um, and I had a small child, so I really, I, I, he kind of had to walk to go to sleep. So this is what <laughs> I would do. I would walk in these, like, missions. And I just sort of marveled at the notion that it is a city where there's so many layers to it. I mean, mm-hmm. I know this is so obvious, but... It is like a palimpsest 
palimpsests. I can't. Mm-hmm. I never know how to say that. Palimpsest. Don't rely yeah, on me okay. for that. <laughs> um, where there, you know, there's sort of like the memory of of text and other things under right underneath mm-hmm. the surface. You just erase it, and it's right there. And I thought, you know, it's so interesting. The um, these streets walking along, and and this is where Picasso's mm-hmm. studio. This is where Max Ernst lived. This is mm-hmm. where Leonora lived. This is, you know, and and I kept. I, I really felt the sort of um, the ghosts mm-hmm. of the city in a way that I know a lot of people again do. But I guess I had a very particular idea and story and characters in mind mm-hmm. so it just they sort of really came alive and then I did do a lot of reading about the crazy surrealist parties mm-hmm. and things that happened in this in this town that I mean they're just they sort of just can't uh, like by nature just come to mm-hmm. life I mean weird you know strange food things and people being naked and like mm-hmm. just just chaos mm-hmm. and amazing you know absurdity and fun <laughs> and one of the things I find um, particularly interesting about the way you present Paris of course is that it's it's in the 30s but of course the story takes us through into the 40s and into the into the occupation as well mm-hmm. and so this is a moment where uh, in one sense Paris changes dramatically mm-hmm. um, but I, which I think is something which is often overplayed in in novels because there's also a sense of kind of life going on as well like a lot of a lot of artists stayed in Paris mm-hmm. during the war and so there was this kind of um, you mentioned layers earlier, and there was a kind of it, one thing I found very interesting in your portrayal was it wasn't just uh, black and white. It wasn't just this sort of like Paris was this glorious mm. party in the thirties and this uh, incredibly sort of grim mm-hmm. occupied city in the forties. There were sort of there were different levels to it and different mm-hmm. um, I mean, different Paris. Yeah, I, guess. I mean that's a, interesting because I, I sort of I'm glad that that's how you interpret it because I feel like um, what I really wanted to get at this in that period was that this is a character who lands in Paris, she's been disowned by her family, she's discovered what she's is mm-hmm. like she sort of I- exactly what I asked Leonora because I said oh and she was a solitary figure who had rebelled her whole life and she landed in Paris and kind of fell in with a surrealist and I said oh you you became a surrealist and mm-hmm. she says I was a surrealist <laughs> and I think you know well I guess you know and that's sort of what my character was I felt like she fi- she'd been sort of you know alone and isolated mm-hmm. most of her life and when she landed in Paris she found who she was mm-hmm. because she found like-minded people and then of course falls into a love affair and I like the notion that when you fall into this thing that's sort of all-consuming in a way war is encroaching but um, it doesn't almost matter to mm-hmm. you what matters to you is what's going on in your world and you're just sort of pulled into this tumult mm-hmm. of this affair and you kind of barely notice what's uh-huh. going on and then suddenly you look up and realize that y- you've got to get yeah. the hell out of here and not know? only do you barely notice it's uh, there's a certain sort of complexity to it as well. I mean, there's one moment where um, later in her life in the book, Ivory observed something like, you know, we didn't know the Nazis weren't going to win. Mm. And then there's something that's very easy from a 21st century perspective to see kind of the, the, the rights and wrongs of it and to say mm-hmm. what you would have done in that perspective. Mm-hmm. But you, you're not afraid to sort of confront that sort of the moral ambiguity that must exist when, as you say, people aren't necessarily, it's not necessarily in the forefront of your mind Mm -hmm. what's going on around you and what will um, Mm. be the outcome. I was less interested in the sequence of uh, events and more interested in how they sort of uh, resonated with the Mm -hmm. characters, I guess. So that Mm -hmm. would be, yeah. So let's let's talk then a little bit about um, Ivory Frame and specifically her, um, her project. I mean, the the title of the book I've been um, sort of I like to kind of hang out in the bookstore sometimes a little bit incognito and just see how people are, are reacting to the books we have on display and I've noticed the the title really intrigues people the dictionary of animal languages <laughs> um, and there's something um, there's something sort of fascinating about the concept maybe you could explain a little bit to us the the yeah, concept it's of funny, her project you no know, because it's it's sort of the first thing that came to me like I said I had that image of an old woman working mm. on a project of importance but also um, for some reason the title always it was always my working title mm-hmm. and I don't know where it came from but I felt like it sort of unlocked something in this project and I sort of like over the course of the writing of the book I I discovered so many fascinating things that sort of better articulated what I was trying Hmm. to think of, which was one of which was I came across sort of you know, when you start to look at sound and um, silences and all these things that I was interested in, I went, you know, I started I found myself reading a lot about John Cage Mm -hmm. and then from John Cage I got to this sort of, um uh, this movement in Japan that happened mm-hmm. that I put in the book where there's sort of um, 
they, you know, they, they, they sort of ask people to what the sort of, what they would consider the most mm. incredible sounds in, in their country, in Japan. So they went around and people would say, you know, the way the wind hit a certain tree in a certain forest mm -hmm. and the way the, the ocean hit a certain shell on a certain beach. And then the organization would go and listen. And <laughs> if they agreed, it would become a protected site. Mm -hmm. And so they were using sound democratically um, for conservation and I thought this is exactly uh -huh. what I thought but someone articulated it <laughs> <laughs> but it was a real thing and I thought this is how I imagined the character because I really am interested in the notion I sort of wanted to write a book about all the things that we don't mm -hmm. say um, and there's lots of people that speak different languages and a translator that takes liberties and um, and in the end it's sort of like you know language so often misses the mark but then mm -hmm. it's also the only thing that marks an experience mm -hmm. even if it's imperfect and so and, and in a way silence is forgetting mm -hmm. so so to record the sounds of animals that were on the brink of extinction would mean mm -hmm. that their voices would not be lost mm -hmm. and they would still you know remain um, in a way we could try to protect them mm -hmm. and have empathy for them. That um, uh, situation in Japan when I read that I, I was going to ask you if it was real or not because it seems almost too perfect a thing to I exist. Know, I mean, I know. It, I mean, maybe I should have fact checked. Uh, it, I, I, <laughs> it can be dangerous to over fact yeah. check things. <laughs> I thought it sounded poetic and beautiful, mm. and I loved the notion of it. So yeah. And of course, one thing that is interesting with Ivory as a character is that she, um, when she's in Paris, she begins. Or, or, or she takes her education as a, as a visual artist mm -hmm. um, and uh, of course then there's this switch to um, this attempt to, 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 to record and to preserve and to transcribe sounds mm -hmm. um, and I, I just thought that was an interesting shift because often we think of people as or artists specifically existing in not necessarily in one medium but in one sort of uh, realm of senses, let's mm -hmm. say. So you know, if you're if you're a visual artist, you might not necessarily uh, you might not necessarily also be able to write poetry, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought it was interesting with your just with your personal example, because I know, as I said in the introduction, that you've, um, for example, you work in uh, fashion as well, mm -hmm. which of course is a very um, visual medium among also a very cultural medium. And I was just wondering, did you draw a lot on that sort of? personal experience of working both as a journalist and in design to sort of to oh, uh, capture a, ivory. That's a good question. I mean, I think that I kind of, I really do believe in the, um, <laughs> Uh, the the winding path or the <laughs> meander. I, I sort of feel like there's no wrong choice. I, I sort of think that our whole lives are made up of our our choices in the end, and and I sort of feel like I, I'm really a believer in going down weird paths. Mm -hmm. They might not really lead you, but then, of course, always in retrospect, you realize, oh right, mm -hmm. you know, becoming a pilot meant that I was going to be in the air all the time, and that's a different perspective, and that's really great for being a writer. <laughs> you know, like it's very weird, but you yeah. would never imagine it at the time. Um, and I, and, and in Ivory's case, I sort of felt like I'm really interested in people in in the, uh, in the many selves of one mm -hmm. human, and certainly when someone lives for long enough, they have lots of lives. In them we all yeah. do and especially people that have lived through trauma mm -hmm. something like a war where you know you sometimes your choice is that you just can't continue living mm -hmm. the way you did before and in her case I think art meant a lot of things the loss of friends and other people that were really mm -hmm. close to her and the loss of that self and she couldn't really move forward and continue to do that so mm -hmm. she had to sort of go bet toward empirical things and something and sort of the act of saving really mm -hmm. so so that's sort of how that shift I felt worked for her was that she couldn't really be herself mm -hmm. the way she had been in the past. I think now might be a nice moment to hear a oh, little extract okay. <laughs> uh, from <laughs> the book. Put this in here. So at my book launch in Toronto, I um, I started to do my reading and couldn't read the book and realized I needed glasses. So ah. Now I have glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Got my eyes tested the next day. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read a, a, a little section. The book is sort of told in two time periods, when Ivory is 19 and when she's 92. Um, and when and then it sort of meanders a little bit. When she's 92, she gets memories. Um, and, and this is one where she is um, recording reindeer languages, reindeer, the sounds of reindeers in Lapland. In the field, there's so much white, my eyes see things that are not here. The same way someone shipwrecked who stares at sea long enough will start to see a sail rise above the horizon. The cold is bitter but preferable, they tell me, to the swarms of mosquitoes so thick in the summer that they duct tape the cracks of the windows, so thick that you swallow insects when you talk. <laughs> 
The scrub for a forest are misshapen from weather, flecked with lichen. I've started to anticipate where the reindeers will be. They're quiet animals, but the herds will become vocal when there are new calves. I'm deposited here each day via a wooden sledge hitched to a herder's snowmobile. The reindeer herder wears fur boots that stick out like paws from underneath his Gore-Tex pants. Reindeer hair is a good insulator, he says, it being hollow. I'm vague about what I'm doing and he doesn't ask. His utter lack of curiosity verges on eccentric. Reindeer have two extra bones in their feet that click so they can hear one another after in the dark. The only reason that reindeer herder takes me is that he needs money. He's had some animal rights people campaign against deer hunting. He sizes me up, alone with my recording equipment and field books, and determines that I'm not here to distribute virtue, that I will leave the landscape and the creatures inviolate. This is when the objectives of those who save and those who kill overlap. On the long ride in, he tells me about how when he slaughters deer, he uses every part. He sells the meat, he uses the skin for clothing and blankets. The heads become dog food, the hooves boots, the antlers handicrafts. The antlers are also ground into a powder and sold to the Japanese, a cure for sexual weakness. It makes me think of Duchamp. He once walked into Café de Flore and Tacita leaned in. Two words, she whispered. Porcelain urinal, I ventured. No, she laughed. Notorious impotence. That is not what I expected you to say, I whispered back. She told me she'd mar he'd married a lascivious peasant girl from Normandy who, as it turned out, had little interest in his cleverness. When he started to launch into one of uh, his ideas, she would say, look, we're here to fuck. Stop telling stories and get on with it. <laughs> this did not go over well with Marcel. It made him incapable of sleeping with her, so she left him. He was crushed. People said he was a destroyed man after that, in a sense. The truth is, the reindeer herder yells over the sound of the engine. It does nothing, but they give me a good price. The herder unhitches the sledge. The trees are being cut, he says. It's so far north it takes 300 years for them to grow again. He pulls a piece of lichen off a tree and holds it out to me as if to accentuate his point. If they cut down the trees, the reindeer can't eat. It means more hay, which costs too much money. The hay? The gas for the snowmobile. I feel alive in the cold, sharp, starved for sound. All my training funnels into this skill, remaining calm and quiet. I wait. It's so still I can't tell which way the wind is. I watch my breath, visible in the cold, not sure if they might be picking up my scent. Then I see them, after all this time, random flashes of pale fur across the white like a hallucination. They come toward me, hooves barely touching snow. They come close to where I'm lying, close enough for me to see the soft under fur, to, fear their sh to feel their shudders, ear twitches, everything in them that is wild. I'm cold, my heart hammering. I can hear their nostrils take in air. I feel the electric intensity that trembles from them, what they know, that there's no order in the world, nothing at all except for this very moment, sure as death. We're the only creature who has the knowledge of our own mortality outside of imminent danger, and yet they know more. They don't have reason, they don't do anything, they just are. What is my snow blindness is their articulated forests of ultraviolet light. And then something extraordinary happens. They stop. The whole herd, over 50 animals. They've been doing a myriad different things, long legs loping and pawing, bodies at every direction. In a flicker, they all stand completely still. Every single one of them freezes. Thank you. Thank you so much. That gives us a nice... Um sort of encapsulation of how of how the the book works in fact of how it's sort of as you mentioned earlier the sort of the fluidity of memory mm -hmm. is sort of moving between the the present or the, the let's say the the, the elderly mm -hmm. ivory and, and her time mm -hmm. in paris um that time in paris is um is marked by uh two very important relationships um and th that was one thing uh that struck me about the about the book as well is that of course i mean there is certainly a um uh, a romantic relationship which is the core of it and which is very mm -hmm. defining um which is with um uh, with with uh, a ukrainian artist called lev mm -hmm. uh but there's also her um her best friend her confidant her um Muse to a certain extent, I mm -hmm. think, um, Tacita, mm -hmm. and I just I'd be interested to hear a little bit about the um, the origins of this kind of almost triangular mm. um, friendship and relationship that you set up in the book. Oh, it's a, it's an interesting way of putting it. I think that um, I guess again, like I had said, I, I think that when she when Ivory lands in Paris, she she'd sort of felt alone so much in her life and her thinking and her um, her way of being, and then she sort of her, the first person she meets is. 
is is Tacita, and she um, immediately they, there's a spark between them that is sort of palpable. They just they just she sees her three times in one day in Paris in various arrondissements and realizes like that she must continue to sort of speak with this woman and the, and she's you know they immediately they fall in together and they conspire together and they collaborate together because of course you know the surrealists were a pretty macho bunch sure. <laughs> um, so I think that you know true to the women that were in that movement um, they they really did find a kind of um, you know, a real sort of buoying thing in, in female friendship. So I really wanted to portray that because I felt like it was really important. And, it, and it's sort of like, um, I, and also in real life, it turns out that Leonora Carrington herself in Mexico City was very close with Remedios Vero. Mm -hmm. She knew Frida Kahlo and mm -hmm. the other surrealists that were there. And But she, she and uh, Remedios Vero got into all these experiments and she called them her al alchemical experiments mm -hmm. in the kitchen. And she sort of wanted to reclaim the notion of, of you know, the kitchen as being a site of power mm -hmm. rather than sort of domestic s slavery. <laughs> um, and so I liked that notion and I liked, I liked the idea that, you know, she was sort of pulled between her her woman friend and then of course as you mentioned she meets this character this larger than life kind of character who's already defined his career in terms of being an artist she's just at the beginning of hers um, and of course you can you know there's there's so many reasons and of why that would be compelling for her but she is sort of pulled mm. between that because Tacita sort of represents the part of her that wants to be who she is and sort of needs to be on her own to live her own life to kind of know that mm -hmm. and then of course there's Lev who kind of you know entices this other world of someone who's already realized mm -hmm. in his work and it's really fascinating for her to be around so it is a conflict and definitely with the um, their progress through through um, their various relationships if, even with that aside one of the sort of um, threads in the book is definitely uh, what it's like to be an artist or what it was like to be an artist in the 20th century as a man and as as a woman mm -hmm. and certainly we see um, without giving too much away we see sort of Lev uh, r despite the hardships he goes through there seems to be kind of doors that open and opportunities mm -hmm. that present themselves mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't uh, happen for Ivory or Tessita mm -hmm. um, and I think that was just a, so it was a fascinating portrayal and it's also there's there's a this great emphasis on um, as you just mentioned sort of this reclaiming I think of one particular uh, moment um, where I, I didn't write down but I think it's Tessita that observes it but correct me if I'm wrong where she said I've never understood why if one doesn't know that women are the ones who convey things in the most interesting ways mm -hmm. we have always observed we have been used to no audience and that has given us room to really see mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just a really um, unconventional representation of the, the say the history of 20th century art mm -hmm. and but something that feels particularly particularly pertinent to to the, to the world we're living in now and the changes mm -hmm. that hopefully mm -hmm. um, uh, anchoring I mean, themselves. I mean, I guess that's, it was funny because I gave a talk at the Tate last night and right behind me was a poster by the Gorilla Girls yeah. that said <laughs> the advantages of being a woman artist. I thought it was sort of perfect, but uh, are there any? Um, mm -hmm. But I, I guess it was... <laughs> but it was sort of... Like, I did really believe that that sort of... I like the notion of, of sort of thinking of um, reclaiming and retelling in the way that um, there are advantages sometimes about being on the outside of something mm -hmm. and certainly observation as a writer or an artist is always going to help you when you're mm -hmm. separate from the thing that's sort of you know that's being channeled in the middle mm -hmm. that's uh, that's uh, sort of seen as what everyone's looking at mm -hmm. you know so I think that in in the case and and certainly having sp having interviewed Leonora that was her fe her feeling mm -hmm. was sort of like well you know I'm just going to do what I do mm -hmm. and and you know I don't care you know uh -huh. she she had this great line where she said literally when she was living in Paris she uh, Picasso said to her he threw her some centimes and said like get me some cigarettes and she looked around and she was like oh I'm the only woman in this room uh -huh. she's like get them yourself and uh -huh. she threw them back <laughs> <laughs> but I mean I think that you know I, I guess you just have to you know it, it's it's it I think there are some advantages certainly there's a mm -hmm. lot of disadvantages but For I sure. wanted to really look at that and how that would feel and I, mm -hmm. I guess it's sort of less theoretical and more you're just in the mind of a woman mm -hmm. who's creating and moving through school and dropping out of school and, and contending with her artwork and contending with mm -hmm. the sort of, you know, sexist views of it at the time and, and, and just sort of, you just sort of, I, I, what I hope is that you're just in her world and mm -hmm. you understand her personal narrative because certainly like a lot of the surrealist artists, the women, um, 
they just would sort of well certainly with Leonora's case she mm-hmm. sort of didn't go towards the Freudian theoretical mm-hmm. stuff um, and she just reclaimed a personal narrative mm-hmm. which you know at, at some point people think is oh you're self obsessed or something mm-hmm. people would used to say that about Frida Kahlo uh-huh. but now that you know they understand that reclaiming your own narrative is actually its own yeah its own work of art it's, it's a funny thing being sort of self obsessed because um, there's another line which just which I noted down which said we grant men a right to solitude why can't we do the same for women mm-hmm. and there is a thing the sort of self-obsession, so-called self-obsession in a man mm-hmm. is considered in some way uh, a sign of sort of greatness as an artist, yeah. whereas in a woman it's, yeah. um, it's condemned. It's a, yeah. But also there's that, int- I th- one thing I find fascinating which you, which you just articulated is this sense of sort of, for male artists there's this kind of structural advantages, mm-hmm. or there were and probably mm-hmm. still are, mm-hmm. and yet those structural advantages, advantages from an artistic point of view could potentially be disadvantaged in a way like you have mm-hmm. um, perhaps in in being sort of excluded being on the on the the, the margins mm-hmm. it gives you a perspective which is le- which is yeah, much I more mean, compelling. I mean there's something to fight against you mm-hmm. know and I think that that you know I, I think that that's certainly what Leonora was like she sort of needed to learn all the rules so she could break them you mm-hmm. know and I think that that's really important mm-hmm. and, and it's really useful when you're making art I think. Yeah. You mentioned um, the the Freudian narrative of the um, of the surrealists. Um, the epigraph of the book is from Carl Jung. Yeah. Um, and earlier we, I mean, we talked about the 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 synchronicity involved in the the conception of the mm-hmm. book. Um, and you also mentioned um, when she first meets or first sees Tacita, there's these three meetings mm-hmm. uh, or th- three encounters, almost by chance, mm-hmm. um, around Paris. And it does um, it did come to me as I was reading the book, um, there does seem to be quite a sort of a Jungian influence. Mm. Um, obviously, you know, I was led that way by um, by the epigraph, but also the the fascination with um, with fairy tales. With n- I mean, there's a moment where you talk about fairy tales and nursery lore being crammed with creatures, mm-hmm. and this sort of uh, s- attributing of symbolic or real value mm-hmm. to uh, to animals and to their sort of our, our place in the sort of in the animal world seems to be quite again quite drawn from mm. from Jung and I was just wondering was that sort of was with the Jungian theories sort of a thread or was this sort of something that it, I'm projecting onto no, the book? No, no, it, it was definitely there. I mean, also because, you know, there's so... Um, I mean, I read Jung's dreams mm-hmm. wh- when I was re- writing the book and I, I sort of feel like... And also, of course, the surrealists. I mean, Breton mm-hmm. says, he, you know, he didn't understand why we put place as much meaning on waking life as we did on... Why wouldn't we bring dreams into that, sure. you know? And so... And, and certainly, the surrealists were so interested in, in, in dreaming and animals kind of work into that because because they're the through line of the book, really, because they're sort of the subject matter for a lot of the surrealists. They're mm-hmm. sort of the ultimate non sequitur. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in terms of Ivory's character, when she's studying animals later in life, they're less sort of dreamlike and they're mm-hmm. more obviously more real and empirical. She's recording them and, you know, observing them. Um, but, you know, they sort of... Um, I just feel like in, in that sense, they also represent... We sort of exist with animals in... It, in a place of silence, mm-hmm. like we, they sort of exist on our periphery. Periphery, they're sort of the ultimate sort of reverend. Mm-hmm. Um, they're the reverence, really, and they sort of, you know. So, so I sort of liked the notion of, of sort of, starting at a place of of fairy tale, dreamlike mm-hmm. surrealism, and moving it towards a more empirical mm-hmm. kind of scientific view of them, I guess. And definitely, there is that sense of um, conservation as well. I mean, mm-hmm. ivory isn't by any means a kind of environmentalist in the sort of traditional, or at least in the kind of cliche sense, but this sort of, this urge to um, to preserve and to protect, and if they can't, and to save mm-hmm. animals, and if they can't be saved, then to at least save a trace mm-hmm. of them is of course central to the um, uh, to the book. And, and, and I, I found anyway, coming out of it, uh, one of the sort of, um, you know, I think it, it's, I don't think novels generally sort of con- should contain sort of messages and I, don't, I certainly don't think um, uh, the Dictionary of Animal Languages contains a sort of, you know, uh, so it's, it's, in, it's in no way preachy, but I came out of it with, um, I, let's say, a heightened sense of, um, of let's say, the importance of conservation, not just from a so necessarily a pragmatic point of view, mm-hmm. but also from a sort of a sort of a moral perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, there was one particular moment where um, she's lamenting that everyone 
when, when we talk about conservation, we talk about sort of like, oh, we need to preserve it for our grandchildren. Mm. And she kind of rails against that. And she says, you know, it's not, it's not about the grandchildren, it's about the animals, um, the animals themselves. Mm. And I was just wondering, did you um, sort of approach the book with a sort of conservationist sort of fervour, or did that... Mm come out of this sort of this this project which you placed into the hands of, of your well, protagonist. Interesting because I sort of um, I wrote as you mentioned I wrote a column for the national newspaper mm. in Canada I wrote an environmental column that was about 750 words a week which mm. is not that long um, and so I had to kind of cram in mm -hmm. um, a lot of conservation issues and environmental issues at the time and I the main thing that I took away from that was that I, I couldn't go deep enough or, mm. or far enough with it so I wrote notes as I was turning in my columns and and they always yeah anyways and, I, and then I would return back to them and I started reading I went way back I went mm. to Spinoza and then you know and then I started reading the deep ecologist Arne Nass mm -hmm. and and then I started really getting into sort of um, eco almost warrior types like mm. the uh, Paul Watson from the Sea Shepherds and I, I sort of was really influenced by that kind of radical although she wouldn't say radical in the <laughs> book because <laughs> she says she's a conserver it's the radicals that are destroying the earth but um but i i sort of was was very influenced mm -hmm. by that kind of like a real spark to kind of like to a call to action mm -hmm. i guess you know and I, and i think that if anything i i feel like when the book what what i sort of felt writing the book was that i i felt so awake when i was mm -hmm. doing it. i just like being open to things like serendipitous things or going on a quest that may or may not fail or you know mm -hmm. i sort of i that's just sort of the thing that i in a way, I found myself through the writing mm. of it. Mm. I think now might be a good time to open to questions from the audience because I don't want to uh, monopolise too much <laughs> of uh, Heidi's time. If you have a, a question, just raise your hand. We'll get a, a microphone um, to you and um, so everyone can hear you. Who would like to kick us off? Don't be shy. <laughs> I know it's always hard to be the first. Thank you very much. Just a very brief question. You said that um, she, uh, with vehemence, denied, uh, well, she had disowned being a sur surrealist when you asked her about this. And it, why? Oh, well, sorry, to clarify, not disown being a surrealist, but just that she, I sort of, it was the way, it was semantics, because I sort of said, oh, you found the surrealists, and she, or you became a surrealist. And she said, I was a surrealist. Like, so she already, she f was born one, as far as she was concerned. She'd already been practicing, you know, her painting since she was a young child, and, and her writing, mm -hmm. she was also a writer as well, and had been writing these fantastical surrealist tales. So she sort of railed against the notion that she found them when she came to Paris because she'd already been a practicing surrealist her sort of whole life is what she'd mm. sort of felt. Mm. Yeah, she wanted to put me in my place. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting notion just of this kind of, of being something as well and I think it connects back to what you were speaking about earlier about the, the many different lives that can exist within one life mm -hmm. and yet there also does seem to be a coherence and that's something we find with with ivory i mean the mm. sort of the ivory we meet uh at the beginning of the book the 92 year old ivory mm. and then before we go back to paris as a reader we're quite sort of uh, quite surprised by the sort of potential sort of differences between mm. these characters mm. but as it as the book progresses and as we get to know her better um we can recognize there can be both differences but this kind of inherent mm -hmm. coherence mm -hmm. to the character nonetheless mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, I just feel like again, I feel like um, um, because the because the events are sort of taken out of sequence, mm -hmm. it takes you a little while to see where she got to. But I think with everyone, you sort of see, oh right, you know that that sort of. Um, you know, this traumatic event led to this, which led to her thinking, and that's why mm -hmm. she is the way she is now, you know. So I, I sort of, I was really fascinated by the fact that we contain so many selves that we're, you know, that things aren't separate. There's things inside mm -hmm. of things. And I'm really fascinated that at that 92, you can still be living all the parts of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More questions? Yes. Um, there, I was listening to a podcast the other day, as I feel like many people are saying <laughs> nowadays, and it was saying about how when the likes of Jane Eyre and the workings of Jane Austen came in to publication, that it kind of tilted the world on its axis because it, as opposed to men writing about women, mm. it was women writing about women 
and almost more importantly women writing about men mm. and the fact that I mean now it's sort of changed but that the idea of what a man was in literature it almost was something other when men were writing about it it was almost like inflated but when women were writing about it it was no this is what a man is and it was because women for so long were observing the 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 other sex the other gender and with you not just being a writer but also being involved in so many other aspects between being a pilot as well as being a designer do you feel that when you go into those other elements do you feel that you're also kind of looking at it as like do you feel like you're more of an observer now that you've written a book about someone who observes mm -hmm. do you kind of have a different world view in the way you look at people and things slightly differently i think that's probably true of all writers that's a great question and i think that i think most writers like you sort of um i can't remember i think it's graham green that said all writers need to have a sliver of ice in their heart <laughs> and i think i mean it's so dramatic but i think there's some truth to that because you kind of do need to uh, you know stand back from a situation to kind of really observe it to be able to write about it and I think that if you're really in it and genuinely like sort of lose yourself in it then it's very hard to stand back and kind of um, you know and, and really sort of write effectively about it I mean I definitely my my varied experiences have helped me I mean certainly as a pilot like I, I was in of all places Texas and it was extre extremely gendered and and I was so weird to them like I was it was the 90s and I was wearing like docks and it, they thought I, <laughs> I was this weird creature <laughs> um, but it helped me because I I really did I was so other and strange to them and I kind of it just allowed me to kind of have this amazing invisibility I mean that's the other other thing that I sort of like about writing about a character who's old is that you know I've talked to so many women who as you get older you know you just become invisible men don't do that in the same way um, and so it, it's very sort of in one sense it's very difficult but in another sense it gives you the power of invisibility which gives you the power to observe instead of being the observed and I feel like especially with women there's sort of this always through our lives there's this tension between you know objecthood and subjecthood otherwise known as being a woman mm -hmm. <laughs> so in in a way it sort of changes as you become an older woman which i was really interested in so it's sort of that same thing of being removed to observe which is again useful i think <laughs> and just bringing up the on the subject of sort of, of of women writers coming to prominence there's a a moment where uh, you talk about emily bronte um, in the book, and just the sort of the the um, the the complexity of the of the character and what we know about her life, and then the poems, um, the poems themselves. And I just thought that was an interesting uh, uh, interesting that you should also bring bring up this kind of this moment where uh, sort of women writers were coming coming to the fore. Um, do we have any more questions? Yes, um, we'll just get you a mic. <laughs> Um, you mentioned one book you read while you were writing. Is there anything else you read which helped inspire you or, you know, which... Oh, that's a good yeah, question. You know, I, I, it was, it's, so this book took almost 10 years to write because I wrote it for three years and then I put it in a drawer for three years because I couldn't figure out how to finish it. <laughs> um, but I did, you know, it's so hard to say because over the course of all those years I read so many things. Yeah. I mean, I try when I'm writing and I know a lot of writers say this to not read a lot of fiction because it can sort of the cadences can get in your thinking and you, you sort of want to just be you know your own voice but I definitely I certainly read a lot about the surrealists um, and I read a lot of surrealist writing which is super weird if you've ever read mm -hmm. it. Leonora Carrington's stories are really interesting I read The Hearing Trumpet and then her collected stories which have recently been republished which are really worth reading because they're so odd and interesting <laughs> um, and I read Young and a lot of animals sort of um, I read a lot of animal sort of consciousness theory and um, yeah I mean just a lot of and I, I yeah anyway just a very disparate kind of bunch of books but I'd say that the most sort of interesting I suppose were the animal um, books about animals I read Peter Singer's Animal Liberation which was really fascinating um, and then I'd say Leonora's work I suppose those are the two threads there that were kind of most influential in my thinking yeah thank you I think we have time for one more question. If it, yeah, that's a lady here. 
So I'm always really intrigued by authors who write about experiences that are very different from their own or like think, I guess, in other words, you've never been a 92 year old surrealist <laughs> painter. It's not like necessary. Not right? <laughs> so I guess in the process of putting yourself in this character's shoes and you talked about like pulling back and observing um, from a very you know, detached point of view. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you learned about yourself as a writer in trying to write about something that you haven't experienced or oh, know, that's explicitly? A, that's a that great way? question. Yeah, I mean, um, I think, like I said earlier, too, I I sort of had this notion of the character, and then when I actually met a ninety-two-year-old, I was like, oh, yeah, that was a that was a thirty-something person thinking of what a ninety-two-year-old would be like. It was totally wrong. Um, so that kind of put me in my place. But I had over the, because I wrote it over such a long period of time. I had so many different things happen. Like I was pregnant at one point. And I remember climbing the steps to my writing studio, which is on the third floor of an attic that's really hot and the steep the steps were really steep and like huffing and puffing and just sort of feeling like I felt slowed down and it was really useful for me because I kind of and uncomfortable in my body and all of the. Thing. So that was helpful, but it was sort of cheating maybe because I, <laughs> I had an insight into that. But it really did give me empathy, I think. I, I hope, anyway, because I, I really, um, I myself would look over... I tend to look over someone who's, you know, reached a certain age. You sort of look at them. And also one of the jobs I haven't listed, but I did work for in a, I don't know how you call them, like an, a long-term healthcare facility of wi with women who are all elderly. And I would read the chart at the end of their bed and think, oh, they were the first medical doctor. Or, or you know, and, and, and you see this woman who was just sort of like crumbled and could barely speak or lost parts of their mind or body. And you just kind of think of them as, as you don't really think of them, I think. So, so as a result... Now I really do, I kind of look at people of all ages and I, I think, you know, I want to sort of know more from them and, and, and understand them. And in fact, in the book, there's a, a line that I used from a, um, in a proverb that I found in Africa that says the death of an elder is like the burning of a library. And I really feel that if you don't um, tell your story or your story isn't observed, then that all that information is lost. And it really struck me, like I still think of that. I just want to hang on to things and kind of understand people's stories before they disappear. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a perfect note on which to um, <laughs> to leave it. Um, we have, uh, at least to leave the, the, the formal part of the evening, do stick around and have um, a glass of wine um, with us. And of course, do buy the Dictionary of Animal Languages. We have plenty of copies at the till. I'm, I imagine Heidi would be delighted to sign yeah. them <laughs> for you. Um, yeah, I think I mean I, I don't think I need to enthuse any more about the book. I think you uh, you've all got a great sense of what a what a what a wonderful read it is, what a transcendent um, experience it is to spend uh, three hundred pages in the mind of of Ivory Frame. Um, so please just join me one more time in saying thank you to Heidi Sapinka. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming, and thanks to Shakespeare and Company and to Adam for being so such a lovely interviewer. <laughs>